Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Echocardiography for Aortic Stenosis in the Taver Era. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the Resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, Look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will also see a white box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and ASE. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Enrique Garcia Sion. Dr. Garcia Sion is the Assistant Professor at UT Health McGovern Medical School in Houston, Texas, board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, and cardiovascular CT. He has expertise in advanced and interventional echocardiography, and he also serves as Director of the Section of Cardiology and Echocardiography Laboratory at Lyndon B. Johnson General Hospital in Houston. A true expert in the field, and we are happy to have him with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Enrique Garcia Sion. Doctor? Thank you, Kelly, for the very kind introduction. And I want to thank the ISC and ASC for uh, organizing this talk. And in particular, Katie Gibson, who will be uh, moderating the Q&A after the talk. The ed educational objectives of today's talk is to uh, understand the echocardiographic criteria and best practices for the accurate diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis. The role of echocardiography in aortic annular sizing and pre-procedural planning for TAVR its role in post-procedural assessment of TAVR patients, and contemporary quantification parameters for paravalvular aortic regurgitation after TAVR. I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose. Transcatheter aortic valves were uh, first uh, FDA approved in uh, late 2011 after the partner one results with the balloon expandable uh, sapien valve. Since then, uh, this technology has uh, significantly evolved and has been expanded to intermediate and low surgical risk patient. The commercially available transcatheter heart valves that uh, are currently uh, being implanted can be divided in balloon expandable, and the example is the Edward sapien valve, and self-expandable, such as the Medtronic Evolute Pro Valve, uh, previously known as Core Valve. There was a third device uh, that is mechanically expandable, that is the Boston Scientific Lotus Valve, that has been uh, voluntarily retired a few months ago, and the manufacturer will concentrate on a different platform. However, if uh, sonographers and cardiologists are doing post-procedure follow-up of patients, uh, they can see any of these three in recently implanted valves. Uh, 
there are other devices that have been used in uh, controlled trials, but uh, these are the ones that, are, that have been FDA approved. Let's talk a little bit about aortic stenosis. We cannot do a TAVR echo talk without talking about proper diagnosis of aortic stenosis. This is defined as a systolic pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta, which can be measured as peak to peak gradient, which is typically uh, done in the cath lab, or maximum instantaneous gradient, which is larger as the peak aortic and LV uh, velocity are not uh, concurrent at the same time. It is uh, very important to measure the mean gradient, which correlates very well with the severity of aortic stenosis in patients with normal cardiac output, and the derived aortic valve variable by continuity equation, which requires uh, proper measurements, as we will discuss in a few slides. Most common etiology of aortic stenosis is calcific, but other etiologies may include rheumatic or bicuspid aortic valve, and the criteria for grading AS severity as per our ASC guidelines are shown on screen. Severe aortic stenosis is defined as a peak velocity of four, a mean gradient of 40, and this uh, correlates to an aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square, which in certain situations can be indexed for body surface area, and that is less than 0.6. The new ACC AHA guidelines continue to recommend the use of disease stages in patients with valvular heart disease. Stage C is severe asymptomatic. C1 is uh, with normal ventricular function and C2 is with uh, decompensated ventricle. And stage D is severe symptomatic. This stage can be further divided into three categories. The most common and classic example is the symptomatic severe high gradient aortic stenosis, that is stage D1, associated with severe leaflet calcification and reduced leaflet opening, velocities and gradients, as I just uh, mentioned. The other stage to know is a D2, and this is the classic low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, typically associated with a stroke volume index of less than 35 milliliters per square meter. However, uh, getting an aortic valve area of less than one with velocities that do not meet criteria for severe aortic stenosis could also be due to incorrect LVOT measurements, LVOT pulse wave Doppler measurements, or a patient that is severely hypertensive at the time of image acquisition. So all those things need to be checked before making a diagnosis of low flow, low gradient AS. And the th third stage of symptomatic severe AS is paradoxical low flow, low gradient. These are patients with preserved ejection fraction, but have reduced stroke volume. They still have a stroke volume index of less than 35. This could be due to a small ventricle or coexisting uh, mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, which decrease the forward stroke volume. A way to differentiate uh, patients with truly severe aortic stenosis in this situation is to utilize the calcium score by uh, cardiac CT, which uh, is more than 1,300 for females and 2,000 for males is the cutoff recommended by the guidelines. The outcomes of these patients with low flow rate and severe AS are, uh, these patients have significantly increased mortality uh, irrespective of ejection fraction and as demonstrated in the PARTNER1 trial. The ASC guidelines, recommend a dobutamine echo starting at a very low dose to increase the stroke volume and determine the flow reserve in patients with low ejection fraction to be able to differentiate pseudo severe from true severe. And as I mentioned earlier, in those with preserved ejection fraction, we don't wanna give them dobutamine. We can perform a calcium score, uh, which can um, correlate with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, a threshold of 3,000 for male and 1,600 for females makes it very likely. This is the current algorithm for management of aortic stenosis from the recently published ACC AHA guidelines. Aortic valve replacement is recommended for symptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis or asymptomatic patients with LV decompensation, ejection fraction less than 50%. This is a stage C2 
and possibly in those with an abnormal uh, treadmill stress test, severely elevated BNP, or what we call very severe aortic stenosis, that is a, a peak velocity of more than five and a mean gradient of more than 60. In terms of the choice of surgical versus transcatheter aortic valve, for those who are of high or prohibitive surgical risk and have a, an appropriate uh, predicted survival with an acceptable quality of life, transcatheter uh, route is recommended. For those uh, younger patients, despite, despite transcatheter aortic valve being approved for even low risk surgical candidates, um, it is still recommended that if the patient is younger than 65, they're candidates for surgery and they have a life expectancy of more than 20 years, a surgical aortic valve is the preferred uh, method. For those who are younger than 50 and candidates for anticoagulation, a mechanical aortic valve uh, is recommended. Transcatheter aortic valve is preferred for those who are older than 80 uh, or have a life expectancy of less than 10 years. And those who are in between uh, have to go through a shared decision-making process to decide what's the best uh, modality for them. The 2017 ACC Expert Consensus Decision Pathway for TAVR provides a framework for managing these patients and highlights the role of the imager as part of the heart valve team. And as you can see, echocardiography is a cornerstone, a cornerstone of imaging assessment before, during, and after the procedure. This is an echo talk, but of course, we have to mention the crucial role of CT for evaluation of patients prior to TAVR. Multimodality imaging is, is very important. Uh, CT is first used to identify, uh, to evaluate the aorta and the iliofemoral vessels, look at tortuosity, calcification, in order to decide what's the best access for these patients. CT, cardiac CT is also the primary method to assess the annular dimensions, perimeter area, sinus of alsada width, sinotubular junction and aorta width, as well as the coronary artery uh, height in order to choose what's the best prosthesis for these patients. So where can echocardiography help? For iliofemoral vessels, you really have to use uh, CT. Uh, echo is the preferred method to confirm AS severity, evaluate the valve and root anatomy, calcium, LV, RV, and other valves. It can be used to determine device site sizing when CT is not an option, develop a procedural plan and post-procedural assessment for pyrovial leak complications and a serial assessment of valve function as well as LV and RV function. The 2017 ASC guidelines recommend uh, the best practices for evaluation of aortic stenosis. Uh, we will go through some of these key steps in the following slides. I wanna spend some time talking about uh, measurements of the LVOT. Uh, we may need to challenge some of the more traditional teaching and perhaps some misconceptions as to where we're supposed to, me to measure it. LVOT is measured in the zoom parasternal long axis view in mid systole from the blood tissue interface, that's the inner to inner edge of the septal endocardium to the anterior mitral leaflet and parallel to the aortic valve plane. Conventional teaching uh, and what a lot of people do is to look for two symmetrical parallel leaflets as shown on the top picture. This measurement is 2.03 centimeters and the second measurement is a bit larger, 2.33. When we use the circle formula to obtain a LVOT area, we obtain a significantly uh, different area here, 3.23 versus 4.26. And these are pictures on the same patients, the same patient, and you can see slicing the LVOT in a way that shows two symmetrical leaflets is actually slicing it off the center and underestimating the diameter. The aortic valve has three leaflets, not two or four. So the true largest LVOT diameter will intersect the right coronary cusp and the commissure between the left and the non coronary cups. So this patient has an LVOT area of 4.61, which is much different than uh, what would be uh, obtained by measuring the first measurement of 2.03 centimeters.
where should we measure the LBOT? Both the ASC and the European guidelines suggest that uh, the measurement should be at the annulus, but that it should be not much different if you measure uh, more proximal, five to 10 millimeters below, with the assumption that the LBOT is cylindrical. I'm showing here pictures from a recent study from uh, Canada, which was looking at the LVOT diameter at different sites and comparing with phase contrast CMR, which is the gold standard. The most common shape, especially in these uh, elderly patients with aortic stenosis, is what we call the hourglass shape. It's not a cylinder, where the AP diameter is much shorter than the medial lateral diameter as you move away from the valve. Uh, and measuring away from the valve leads to a very significant up to 21% underestimation of the stroke volume and the aortic valve area. And this slide is extracted from a very nice letter to the editor by Dr. Becky Han, published uh, soon after the release of the 20, 2017 guidelines, challenging some of these uh, traditional uh, uh, teachings, uh, measuring uh, the LVOT away from the analyst is not recommended. You should try to measure uh, away from any ectopic classification. Do not include the calcium in the measurement. And one tip that she recommends is the predicted LVOT diameter using this formula shown on screen. And if your measured LVOT is uh, more than two millimeters smaller or larger than the predicted LVOT, suspect an error in measurement. In terms of pulse wave Doppler, we need to obtain laminar flow, place the uh, sample volume at the same location where the LVOT diameter is measured, small sample volume, optimizing gain settings, and position just proximal to the flow acceleration zone so that the spectral Doppler profile does not show an opening and closure click. Continuous wave Doppler has to be interrogated from multiple acoustic windows because the insonation angle can result in underestimation of the velocity. This includes right parasternal, suprasternal, and the use of the non-imaging PDF probe. The same window where you're obtaining the uh, maximum velocity is the one that should be used for LBOT velocity and aortic valve area calculation. If you get the highest velocity from a right parasternal window, you cannot use a five chamber pulse wave doubler of the LVOT to do an aortic valve area calculation. In that case, the aortic calculation, valve area calculation may not be possible. Reminder that in patients with AFib, you need to average five consecutive beats and that our current ISC standards uh, do recommend the use of the non-imaging probe and interrogation of multiple windows. More than 50% of uh, elderly patients with AS have an angle between the aorta and the LV that makes it that the apical window will not yield the highest velocities. What's the role of echocardiography in pre-procedural imaging? So in terms of the aortic, aortic valve, confirm the pathology, the number of cusps, evaluate for insufficiency, the volume distribution and eccentricity of calcification, assess the aortic valve hemodynamics, the LVOT, aortoannular complex dimensions, and then a comprehensive assessment of the rest, the rest of the heart, the mitral valve, the LV, the RV, any uh, pulmonary hypertension, and any pericardial effusion. In order to talk about pre-procedural planning, we need to uh, understand the aortic root anatomy. When we talk about aortic annulus, we refer to the tightest part of the aortic root, which is defined as a virtual ring with three anatomical anchor points at the nadir or hinge points of each aortic leaflet. This is uh, different than the ventricular arterial junction, which can be defined anatomically, but is located much higher than the true aortic annulus. If you undersize the valve with regards to the annulus, you can end up with parvivary regurgitation and valve embolization. And if you oversize, you can, um, this can lead to AV block, or aortic uh, annular rupture. The transcatheter processes are designed to be slightly oversized with regards uh, to the annulus. Also good to note the relationship of uh, other anatomical structures, including the AV node and the membranous septum with regards to the non-coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp. Annular sizing is predominantly done with uh, cardiac CT, 
but it can be done with TEE and three-dimensional echo. This study compared the cross-sectional three-dimensional TEE to 2D TEE uh, annular uh, areas. And there was a significant difference. The, uh, it, it turns out that 3D uh, annular area is fairly accurate and it can be utilized as an alternative to CT when uh, CT is not feasible. The 2017 consensus recommendations actually highlight this, uh, particularly in patients who, uh, in, in whom a second CT may not be possible due to contraindications to contrast or severe renal insufficiency. I'm gonna quickly show you what the method would be to determine the annular area precisely with 3D TE. We acquire a high quality 3D volume of the aortic valve. We go to the 3D multiplanar reformatting, lock the three planes and center them in the aortic valve. We align the blue plane in this case and the red plane with the aorta. Find a good systolic frame. Then in the green box, we will turn the red line until it intersects the center of the right coronary cusp. We will slide the green plane back and forth until we reach that nadir of the right coronary cusp until you see it disappear in the short axis. At that point, that point is, that point is fixed and we don't wanna slide the lines. We'll tilt the green plane. We're not sliding, we're tilting until we can see the non-coronary cusp and then rotate the planes to intersect the nadir of the non-coronary cusp. We can tilt the planes again so that you are perfectly aligned with the nadir of both the non and the right coronary cusp. And then all we have to do is do the same maneuver for the left coronary cusp. At that point, we can, uh, we can be certain that we are at the nadir of the three cusps and we can measure the annulus areas, circumference, diameters, and calculate the area and circumference derived diameters. We can uh, slide uh, the green plane until you see the left coronary artery, the left main, turn our blue plane to the left main and measure the left main coronary height from the nadir of the left coronary cusp to the left coronary. We can do a similar maneuver to measure the right coronary uh, height. We advance the plane to measure the sinus of Valsalva, sinotubular junction, and aorta width. So essentially the same measurements that you uh, obtain with CT can be obtained with uh, 3D TEE, but of course CT is the preferred method if possible. Let's talk about intraprocedural imaging with TEE, which is at this point optional. Most labs are uh, leaning towards a more minimalist approach using transthoracic echo echocardiography. But TEE may be particularly useful in complicated cases. It does require general anesthesia, but it gives you a much more detailed visualization of the aortic valve structures. We can use it for pre-procedure imaging to avoid complications and immediate post-procedure to assess for complications. It can assist with positioning of the valve and deployment of the valve, which is tricky with transthoracic imaging. It can help with transapical cannulation, which is usually done under general anesthesia, and assessment of the valve post-deployment for position, PVL, and the coronaries. This slide that I'm showing is what we call live 3D MPR with TEE, illustrating the deployment of a balloon expandable valve. We can verify the valve is correctly positioned. And as it expands, it shortens from the ventricular end. And then you can see the final deployment. In terms of positioning, the balloon expandable valve is shown on top on panels A and B. Uh, as I mentioned, it's gonna shorten from the ventricular edge. It's gonna be positioned typically on a 50-50 location. And as it's deployed, the ventricular edge will shorten. In contrast, the self-expanding valve, uh, which is shown on panels C and D, are typically not, not symmetrical uh, located prior to deployment. The ventricular edge is gonna be lower anteriorly and higher or more aortic posteriorly. But once the valve uh, is deployed, 
it will become more coaxial. The goal should be that the ventricular edge is three to five millimeters below the annular plane. Intraposterior imaging with TTE serves a similar goal. It can also serve uh, to uh, confirm the position of the stiff wire, pacing wire, or transcatheter valve. We will uh, talk in more details on how to assess paravalvular regurgitation, which is a key element of the intraprocedural evaluation of these patients. This is an example of a patient with uh, severe aortic stenosis that was sent for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Fluoroscopy images showing the coplanar angle, which is where the nadir of all three cusps are aligned and the right coronary cusp is positioned in the center. The intervention is performed at balloon aortic bavuloplasty first and notice the different wires uh, in the heart, including a pacing wire in the right ventricle, a pigtail catheter in the right coronary cusp, and then the guide wire. The valve is advanced to its final position. Aligned with the annulus as assessed by fluoroscopy. But again, if you have transesophageal echocardiography and sometimes TTE, this can help confirm the position. And then the valve is deployed and notice the shortening of the balloon expandable valve from the ventricular edge of the stent during deployment. Immediately after valve deployment, the sonographer takes some images looking for any uh, issues, any complications, any significant paravalvular regurgitation. You can see a little bit of regurgitation that is intravalvular it's, uh, and it's related to the wire that is still uh, across the valve. They may perform an angiography as well to see if there's any significant regurgitation. And then uh, prior to the patient leaving the lab, uh, comprehensive hemodynamic evaluation of the, of the valve velocities and evaluation for paravalvular aortic regurgitation from multiple views. Post-procedure imaging with TTE includes uh, assessment of the ventricles, the valve structure, position, stability, motion, expansion, shape, any regions of separation uh, between the valve stent and the annulus, valve hemodynamics, peak velocity, peak and main gradient, aortic valve area or effective orifice area rather, and uh, the presence of any paravalvular regurgitation, severity and location. In terms of assessing the effective orifice area and the post transcatheter aortic valve replacement stroke volume, we need to take some different measurements than are traditionally done pre-procedure. The LVOT diameter should be measured in most cases from the outer edge to the outer edge of the stent frame. Pulse wave Doppler uh, sample volume should be placed just apical to the proximal end of the stent. In this case, this measurement is incorrect because it is measured within the valve stent. This should only be done if the stent protrudes into the LVOT. We got an LVOT diameter of 1.8, but this was a 23 millimeter valve. So you have to wonder how does a 23 millimeter valve after full deployment result in an LVOT diameter of 1.8 centimeters. The proper measurement was about 2.1 centimeters, which is in line with what would be recommended. I'm gonna go back one slide because uh, this, is a, this is an important recommendation. Um, uh, most uh, core lab trials will recommend that we measure the LVOT and the pulse wave Doppler at both locations, at the ventricular end of the stent and in the stent, just proximal to the leaflets. And similarly, we have to measure the LVOT at both locations. As an echocardiographer, if I'm given 
this view and I want to measure within the stent, that's easy to do. But if I'm not giving the proper pulse wave sample volume position, uh, I can only work with what I have. So let's uh, follow that with this question for everyone to think about. Look at this valve, look at how it's sort of protruding into the LV. How would you measure the neo LVOT? Right here at the ventricular edge from outer edge, as I mentioned earlier, right here within the stent, proximal to the leaflets, or out here, uh, sort of finding the, uh, the end of the myocardium at the level of the annulus? The answer is B. We must be sure to measure the pulse wave Doppler at the same site, so ideally both. In this particular case that we just showed, you would measure it instant because that, that's where we're performing the LVOT measurement. But ideally, you should also do at the ventricular edge of the stent, which is the most conventional method. Let's talk about normal values. As with anything in echocardiography, uh, the best practice is to look at tables that are specific for each device. The rule of thumb is that a normal Doppler velocity index is more than 0.45 for a TAVR valve. But this study uh, by Dr. Han and others in normal individuals shows that the true uh, absolute lower limit of normal is a bit lower than 0.45, and it might be closer to 0.25 for a balloon expandable and 0.3 for a self-expandable valve. Again, the best practice is to know what type of valve and size was implanted and check these tables to make sure your velocity gradient, Doppler velocity index and effective orifice area are normal for this particular valve type. And then follow the DVI or the effective orifice area longitudinally in the same patient. To that point, we define possible stenosis as an increase in mean gradient of more than 10 with concomitant decrease in effective orifice area of more than 25% and or Doppler velocity index of more than 20% and probable stenosis, increase in mean gradient of more than 20 millimeters of mercury, decrease in EOA of more than 50% and DVI of more than 40%. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about Paravalval aortic regurgitation, also known as paravalval leak. This meta-analysis shows why this matters. Uh, it is a little bit old. It's from the sort of first generation transcatheter valves. The newer generations have a much lower incidence of paravalval leak. But nevertheless, this noted that um, moderate or severe PVR was associated with a 2.3-fold increase in one-year mortality. Similar results were noted uh, in the PARTNER2 trial, much more recent data, which also uh, shows significantly worse outcomes uh, in those with moderate or higher paravalvular leak when compared with those with no or trace paravalvular leak. At least moderate PVR in this more contemporary study was relatively rare, but nevertheless associated with increased risk of death and heart failure. Um, it is not totally clear if uh, mild paravalvular leak has any significance. There's different opinions in that regard. How do we assess paravalvular aortic regurgitation severity? Let's refer to the 2019 ASC guidelines for assessment of valvular regurgitation after transcatheter valve intervention. As with any of the most recent ASC guidelines, we have to use multiple criteria and integrate. No single criteria makes a diagnosis. We assess parameters such as the vena contracta width, the vena contracta area, the circumferential extent of the paravalvular leak. Very important, these jets are eccentric and non-circular. And of note, a circumferential extent of more than 30% is associated with a severe PVL. The presence and size of a flow converges the pressure half time, and the presence or absence of diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta. When uh, four criteria are met, you have a diagnosis, but in the majority of cases, that's not the case. And we're gonna have to do 
uh, additional quantification. This uh, separate study um, proposes a different uh, classification that is uh, more in line with what the uh, Vald Academic Research Consortium and many laboratories do to insert a little more granularity than mild, moderate, and severe, but add mild to moderate and moderate to severe. So a five uh, class classification. Same parameters. And notice that the uh, circumferential extent more than 30%, pressure half time less than 200 milliseconds, and a hollow diastolic flow reversal, but with a very important caveat that the end diastolic velocity has to be more than 25 centimeters per second. A lot of elderly people have uh, non compliant calcified aortas and can have a little bit of diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, particularly from the suprasternal window in the absence of any aortic regurgitation. So uh, it's always recommended that sonographers assess the flow of the aorta prior to valve deployment so we can have a baseline. Acoustic shadowing can be problematic uh, for assessment of paravalvular leak. Uh, these are metallic valves. And uh, notice on the picture on the left, you have the same patient with a transthoracic and a transesophageal echocardiography. And uh, notice how different the jet looks depending on, on, on where you see it. The fact is this whole section between four and eight o'clock is uh, oftentimes not visualized because of the shadowing from the metallic structures. In order to interrogate this section, we need to make sure we look at our apical views. An apical five will interrogate the area between four and six o'clock and an apical three between six and eight o'clock. The fact that you don't see a leak in that area from the parasternal window doesn't mean it's not there. And in transesophageal echocardiography, we have to look at transgastric images. These jets can be very eccentric and they can be oblique and, and just move around the LVOT wall. Particularly anterior jets can be directed across the short axis plane because when entering the LVOT, they are deviated posteriorly by the prominent septum, thus appearing larger. So uh, these jets can be underestimated or overestimated depending on how you look at them. We need to assess the structural parameters, the stent morphology and position. Is it appropriately high or low? Is the shape of the stent non-circular on a, on a short axis? And notice here uh, a little area of uh, dense calcification in the annulus and a little area of malaposition. If you see a clearly visible free space between the stent and the annulus, that uh, may indicate valve under expansion. Real-time 3D echo may assist, and uh, you have to look at other clues, such as uh, left ventricular dilatation and reduction in ejection fraction, which may indicate significant probability leak that is otherwise not seen. With color Doppler, we have to evaluate the short axis at multiple levels. The most important one probably uh, at the ventricular edge of the stent, but also within the valve stent and above the valve stents. We can also use the short, the long axis view rather, and biplane imaging with color at multiple level. This allows you allows us to quantify the jet percentage width with regards to the LVOT, just under the apical border of the stent, the circumferential jet extent that I already showed you how important it is and the vena contractor width, but the vena contractor width can be very difficult to assess with 2D because of the eccentricity of these jets. Here are a few examples of uh, the circumferential extent as it uh, pertains to different grades of severity. Doppler parameters that we utilize include the pressure half time, uh, less than 200 corresponds to severe, with the caveats that I already mentioned, patients with significant diastolic dysfunction, high LVEDP, or um, stiff aortas can have a short pressure half time in the absence of severe regurgitation, and the flow reversal in the descending aorta, 
especially if also noted in the abdominal aorta and if the end velocity of more than 20 centimeters per second. And of course, if it was not present pre-procedure. Quantitative Doppler assessment of the regurgitant volume can be obtained by um, volumetric or LVOT stroke volume. If we properly measure the neo-LVOT with the methods I described, and we subtract the RVOT stroke volume, or if we have a properly done on foreshortened uh, LV stroke volume, uh, ideally with contrast, ultrasound enhancing agent, or with 3D echo, we can obtain the regurgitant uh, volume. This is uh, tricky and it requires a lot of practice to be done correctly. And obviously the RVOT has to be properly visualized and ideally averaged uh, from two different views. A very useful method is the 3D uh, MPR for assessment of the vena contracta area. You can see this very eccentric jet and we've managed to align the planes with the jet and measure the uh, area of the jet, which can be much more, uh, it can correlate much better with the regurgitant volume than a vena contracta width. Imagine if the jet was very elongated wrapping around the LVOT and you measure the width on its narrower portion that would significantly underestimate the jet size. And if you measure it on the widest portion, you would probably overestimate the size. Another thing to uh, talk about is stress catheter heart valve thrombosis. This is something that was previously under-recognized, but is catching a lot of attention these days. We uh, still don't know exactly what to do to prevent this, um, uh, just a few days ago, the Atlantis trial was presented at ACC, and it, it does not seem that a prophylactic and coagulation is actually uh, preventive of clinical out outcomes, though it does prevent uh, thrombosis. But we do see patients come with symptoms of heart failure and uh, decrease in functional status, increased velocities on transthoracic echo, and then we can see the thickening and reduced motion of the leaflets in uh, TEE uh, and particularly in, in cardiac CT. That's what we call the uh, hypoattenuating leaflet lesion and reduced leaflet motion uh, in CT nomenclature. In this study, trascatheter heart valve dysfunction was defined as a mean aortic valve pressure gradient of more than 20 uh, millimeters of mercury or uh, an aortic valve area of less than 1.2. And um, notice that um, the, this, this function, the final uh, diagnosis of, of thrombosis was uh, performed based on the response to anticoagulation. If the patient got anticoagulation and the gradients improved, then a diagnosis of thrombosis was made. And this is 2.8% uh, of patients with transcatheter valve in this study, of course, the treatment is uh, oral anticoagulation once detected. And the duration of oral anticoagulation is not completely established also in these patients. This is a patient we uh, took care of who presented with heart failure symptoms. Uh, he had a valve in valve, transcatheter aortic valve in, within a surgically implanted valve many years ago. And this is uh, one of the risk factors for transcatheter heart valve thrombosis, valve in valve. Patient presented with reduced eje ejection fraction, heart failure symptoms, shortness of breath. And on TEE, we determined that one of the leaflets was uh, thickened and, and uh, not opening completely. The patient was treated with uh, oral anticoagulation and the gradients went back to baseline. Interestingly, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, oral anticoagulation had been uh, interrupted and the velocities started going up again. This was confirmed by a uh, multi-detector CT and the patient has remained on permanent uh, oral anticoagulation since. So in conclusions, Echocardiography has a fundamental role in the multimodality evaluation of TAVR patients pre, intra, and post-procedurally. Following the best practices for echocardiographic examination and measurements is key to optimal patient selection and follow-up.
very important to know how to properly measure the LVOT pre-procedure and post-procedure and uh, making sure that we're following all of our IAC guidelines and recommendations in terms of interrogating the valve from multiple uh, windows and using the non-imaging probe. 3D TE has an emerging role for annular sizing when multi-detector CT is suboptimal or not feasible, but it does require a lot of experience and a standardized technique as I demonstrated. Echocardiographic evaluation of the effective orifice area and paravalvular aortic regurgitation in transcatheter aortic valves is unique and requires some uh, different criteria for severity. And with that, I think we're right on time at 45 minutes and we have some time to answer some questions. Okay, thank you very much. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC ECHO, I'd like to introduce Katie Gibson, our Director of Accreditation. She'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Katie, would you like to start us off? I sure would. Thanks, Kelly. Um, thanks, Dr. Garcia Sayan. That was such a great presentation, and we have lots of great questions coming up. I'm going to start off with this one. Um, when should the aortic valve area be indexed? Well, that's a, that's a good question, because uh, the guidelines do recommend an aortic valve index of 0.6 or less as a marker of severe aortic stenosis. And this should typically be used uh, in people that are very small, a body surface area of less than 1.6, because perhaps an aortic valve area that falls just below one may actually not be severe in these patients, especially when it correlates with uh, lower than severe gradients. You have to be very careful when indexing the aortic valve area in patients that are morbidly obese, especially those with a body surface area of more than 2.4. If everything else indicates moderate aortic stenosis and your index is less than 0 0.6 because the patient is obese, I would not call that severe. Oh, let's see. Um, here's, we've got a lot of questions asking if the LVOT is filled with calcium, do you have any tips on where best to measure the LVOT diameter? Do you have um, any, any tips on how to optimize? Can you get it from a different window? Yeah, this is a good question. And of course, a lot of the slides I showed about LVOT diameter uh, measurement on 3 dte uh, do not correspond to a patient with severe calcific aortic stenosis. It can be, it can be very tricky. Uh, the key element is to make sure you optimize your window as, as, as good as possible. We're talking always about a parasternal window, but you may want to go up one or two intercostal spaces to make sure your uh, LVOT and aortic root are as horizontal as possible in your screen. So this is going to be different than the, the regular long axis view that you use for um, LV measurements, for example. You know, just zooming in on the LVOT from that view may not render the best measurement. Um, this uh, also needs to, you need to um, sweep uh, accurately to make sure you're intersecting the LVOT at its maximum diameter. We talked about um, making sure that you're intersecting the right coronary cusp and the commissure between the left and the non, and that can be easy easily done with biplane imaging, but with single plane imaging, you have to just be very, very careful and slowly sweep to make sure you're uh, pausing on the frame that shows the maximum diameter. In terms of the bulky calcification, we should exclude the calcium from the measurement. We should not measure within the calcium because this calcium is not circumferential. And oftentimes you're just looking at one spot of calcium. And if you measure within the calcium, you're going to uh, dramatically underestimate the LVOT area. I hope that answered the question. I think so. Um, oftentimes with aortic stenosis cases, due to the angle 
um, of the Doppler from the five chamber versus the three chamber, we, we might get some velocities that are higher in the five versus the three. So in those cases, do you admit the lower values, use an average, do you pick the highest velocity? Um, what should we be doing? So in terms of differences in velocities between one window and the other, we should always pick the window that yields the highest velocity. Because as I mentioned, in a lot of these uh, older adults, uh, the angle between the LV axis, so to speak, and the LVOT and the aorta may be such that uh, a particular apical view may not orient the ultrasound beam truly parallel to the LVOT and aortic flow. Then depending on that insonation angle, and the cosine of the angle really, uh, you may significantly underestimate the velocity, especially if that angle is more than 30 degrees. So if you get a velocity of let's say 3.5 meters per second from both of your apical views, but then you decided to use your non-imaging PDOF probe from the suprasternal or ripersternal window and you get a velocity of 4.3, I would certainly take the higher velocity, the 4.3. And this is, of course, assuming you're not um, overgaining, you're, you're measuring the true uh, dense uh, model velocity and not measuring any of the feathering artifact that you might see if the images are overgained. In terms of within one window, uh, in patients with irregular beats, let's say uh, patient in atrial fibrillation, then uh, once you pick the window that gave you the highest velocity, in that particular window, you can't just pick the highest velocity. You have to average at the very least three and ideally five consecutive beats. You have to measure the LVOT, VTI in that same window and also average three to five consecutive beats. Oftentimes we see that just uh, the highest velocity gets picked and that is not physiologic in a patient with an irregular heartbeat. Thank you. Does it make sense or is it recommended to do, um, to use the PDOF or the non-imaging non transducer in patients with TAVR or surgical aortic valve replacement? Yes, absolutely. The same, uh, the same criteria will apply to these patients. We always have to use the PDOF if we see, uh, if we have any suspicion for aortic stenosis, any increased velocities, we have to interrogate multiple windows and use a non-imaging probe, absolutely. But as I mentioned, if you are interrogating uh, the highest velocity from a window in which you don't have a VTI of the LVOT from the same angle, that's not a valid calculation for effective orifice area or Doppler velocity index, but for sure, you should look at that highest velocity from the window that gives you the higher one. And um, what is the best way to determine AI from an abscess versus a paravalvular leak? It's a good one. Well, that's a little bit tricky because uh, uh, these patients, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're referring to uh, transthoracic echo. Yes. Um, uh, you know, abscesses typically occur in the aortomitral continuity, fibrosa. Um, and, uh, you know, if you see an area of uh, echolucency around that area, you may want to uh, go ahead and do a TEE because it's, it's a diagnosis that you really don't want to miss uh, because that, would, uh, that might be a surgical uh, indication. So... Um, Yes, that's correct. The hissence of the valves and resulting paravalvular leak can also be related to infection and abscess. And that's an important thing to, to, to identify uh, early on. I would just not hesitate to do a transesophageal echocardiography in those cases. Well, and speaking of TEE, do you have any tips on how to obtain the aortic valve gradients in the, um, the gastric views on TEE? Well, in, in general, the gradients are going to be more reliable with, with TTE, with transthoracic echo. Um, having said that, uh, if you're looking at the ratio or the Doppler velocity index, provided you're in the same window, uh, 
and at the same angulation, that should be fairly reliable if you interrogate the LVOT and then the aortic valve. But in reality, I don't trust the uh, transgastric uh, velocities as much as I trust the ones obtained by transthoracic. Uh, um, sometimes it is what it is. There's no maneuver that can give you the, 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 a perfect alignment of your ultrasound beam with the flow. However, you know, ideally we might measure from a deep transgastric view and antiflex the probe, uh, perhaps do a little clockwise rotation. Sometimes you need to increase your angle slightly to 20 or 30 uh, and try to identify the view that gives you the most parallel flow. Another uh, way is a higher angle uh, from, a from a deep transgastric view, somewhere between 120 and 130 that gives you more of a long axis view uh, of the ventricle of the LVOT, analogous to a three chamber view on transthoracic. But again, if the gradients from TTE are different than those from TEE, go with your TTE. Gotcha. Um, we have a good, good question about um, what should be included in the conclusion on the final echo report for your post TAVR patients? That's a really good question. So um, I uh, really like to include the neo LVOT measurement because serial echoes in which the neo LVOT is uh, measured differently. And we already discussed how particular this measurement is in these patients will render different effective orifice areas. So then the EOA is going growing and shrinking depending on how you measure the LVOT. So I'd like to include that on my report. Um, uh, it should be in the, in the numerical section for sure, but I, I'd like to include it in the, in the text sec section. I also like to include the uh, make and model of the valve, what type of valve and the date of implantation. And of course the, uh, the standard parameters, including peak velocity, peak gradient, mean gradient, and effective orifice area. I always talk about the presence of abs or absence of parabolic regurgitation. And if so, if there is parabolic regurgitation, grade it according to these different criteria. Now I showed two different uh, grading systems, mild, moderate, and severe, and the five class grading system. That is really up to each laboratory to decide how they want to do it, but the important parameter, the important thing is consistent consistency among sonographers and among readers, so that the lab is always using the same the same system. Thank you, and thank you for mentioning the standard <laughs> parameters. Um, where is the correct placement of the pulse wave Doppler in the descending aorta when you're assessing uh, for flow reversal? Well, it's a matter of sensitivity and specificity. I think if you, uh, you should always try to look for the abdominal descending aorta. We know it's not always easy, it's not always feasible, but you should always look for it. If you find holodiastolic flow reversal in the descending abdominal aorta, that is severe aortic regurgitation. There's no question about it. The suprasternal uh, window uh, allows you to interrogate the proximal descending aorta, and that is uh, more sensitive but less specific. As I mentioned, patients with moderate or moderate to severe uh, parabolic regurgitation may have diastolic flow reversal in the proximal descending aorta. So we want to look not only for a high end diastolic velocity of that jet, we said 20 or 25 centimeters per second, depending on what guideline you read, uh, but also uh, concomitant reversal in the abdominal aorta to in increase the specificity of that finding. Gotcha. And um, I think that was about all we had time for. Um, again, I appreciate this. This was such a great Q&A session. The comments are, or the questions are fantastic. Um, do you have any final tips or uh, you know, words of advice for us? Well, I think uh, practice is key. Uh, labs that are uh, getting started on Taver, uh, 
or sonographers that are getting started on Tabor, it's, it's always a good idea to have a sort of a lead person, a lead physician and a lead sonographer develop protocols that are specific to the lab and specific to the institution uh, for consistency. And that person can train others and can help train new people that come in the lab. Um, uh, this is rapidly evolving. And as I mentioned, there's different criteria for different parameters and uh, consistency and standardization within YM lab while keeping with the standard uh, recommendations from ISC and the ASC is key. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we're going to turn it over to Kelly so she can tell everyone how they can get their credits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again, everyone. And a very special thank you to Dr. Garcia Sion for his presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Echocardiography for Aortic Stenosis in the Taver Era. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and anytime thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.